Fatty acids, which contain an odd number of carbon atoms, are broken down in a very similar way to the ones that contain an even number of carbon atoms. The only difference is, in the breakdown of fatty acids with an odd number of carbon atoms, one of the final products that we form is a molecule, a three carbon molecule, known as propanyl coenzyme A. So aside from generating the acetyl coenzyme A molecules, we also generate propanyl coenzyme A molecules. So let's suppose we have an odd chain fatty acid that contains five carbon atoms. So we have carbon atom one, two, three, four, and five. So once we activate this molecule and we transport it into the matrix of the mitochondria, in the matrix it undergoes a beta oxidation process in the same way that the even chain fatty acid undergoes a beta oxidation process. Now, Remember that in the even chain fatty acid breakdown, we generate acetyl coenzyme A molecules only. And those acetyl coenzyme A molecules are fed into the citric acid cycle to help generate acetyl uh, to help generate ATP molecules. But in the case of odd chain fatty acid breakdown, not, not only do we generate the acetyl coenzyme A, we also generate a propanyl coenzyme A, a three carbon molecule. Now, what happens to this propanyl coenzyme A? This will be the focus of this lecture. So, basically, inside the matrix of the mitochondria, the propanyl coenzyme A molecule undergoes a three step process. And in this three step process, we transform the propanyl coenzyme A into a succinyl coenzyme A. So we see that the ultimate fate of this propanyl coenzyme A that we produce in the oxidation, the breakdown of our chain fatty acids is to form the succinyl coenzyme A. Why? Well, because the succinyl coenzyme A is an intermediate of the citric acid cycle. So we basically form the succinyl coenzyme A, place it into the citric acid cycle, and that helps us generate ATP molecules that the cell can use for energy. So what exactly is this three-step process? This is what I'd like to focus on in this lecture. And let's begin with step number one. In step number one, we basically want to transform this three carbon molecule, the propanyl coenzyme A, into a four carbon molecule known as dimethylmalonyl coenzyme A. And the enzyme that catalyzes this reaction is a carboxylase. Now, any carboxylase requires three things. It needs an energy source, it needs a carbon source, and it needs vitamin B molecule. Now, that vitamin B molecule is biotin. Now, the energy source that this enzyme uses is ATP. So it basically hydrolyzes that ATP to form ADP, and it uses the energy that is released to drive this reaction forward. Now, the carbon source that it uses is bicarbonate. It uses a bicarbonate to basically take that carbon dioxide and place it onto the propanyl coenzyme A, and that helps us generate the methyl malonyl coenzyme A. So it hydrolyzes an ATP molecule, takes that energy and uses that energy to basically help attach that carbon dioxide onto the propanyl coenzyme A. And this entire process requires a vitamin B12 molecule, vitamin B, uh, B7, known as biotin. So this carboxylase is known as propanyl-CoA carboxylates because this is the substrate of this reaction. So we have propanyl coenzyme A carboxylase uses the biotin and hydrolyzes an ATP and helps and that helps attach the carbon dioxide onto the propanyl coenzyme A to form the D isomer of methyl malonyl coenzyme A. So the most important takeaway lesson from this particular step is to remember that the propanyl coenzyme A carboxylase needs three things. An energy source, the ATP, it needs a carbon source, the bicarbonate, and it also requires a biotin molecule. Now, this is step number one. 
in step number two, we basically want to take this D methyl malonyl coenzyme A and transform it into the, uh, into the L isomer form. So we want to transform the D methyl malonyl coenzyme A into the L methyl malonyl coenzyme A. Why? Well, because the enzyme in the last, the third step of this process, it uses, it only uses the L isomer and not the D isomer. So the enzyme that catalyzes step number two, the conversion of the D isomer into the L isomer is methyl malonyl coenzyme A racemase. And so we transform the D methyl malonyl coenzyme A in which we have this methyl group pointing out of the board into this L isomer form in which the methyl group is now pointing into the board. And the reason is because the enzyme in the third step, the methyl malonyl coenzyme A mu taste only acts on the L isomer and not on the D isomer. So let's move on to step number three. Now step number three is basically catalyzed by this methyl malonyl coenzyme A mutase and what it does is it catalyzes an intramolecular reaction, an intramolecular rearrangement reaction in which a group, namely this entire group, is transported from the carbon number two onto this methyl group. In the process, that exchanges an H atom, as we'll see in just a moment. Now, just like in the case of this carboxylase, it requires biotin for its activity. In the case of this mutase, it requires vitamin B12. In fact, without vitamin B12, this reaction would not actually take place. So, let's see exactly what we mean by an intramolecular rearrangement reaction that is catalyzed by this mutase. And let's begin with this L isomer of methyl malonyl coenzyme A that we formed in step number two. So this is our molecule. So this is carbon number one, carbon number two, and carbon number three. And the ultimate goal is to take this entire group that is shown in blue and to move it from carbon number two onto this carbon that is part of this methyl group. Now, how exactly is this reaction actually catalyzed? Well, that's where vitamin B12 actually comes into play. So part of that vitamin B12 molecule is shown in this diagram and it contains a radical. So we have a single electron on this carbon. Now, remember from organic chemistry that radicals are very reactive. And what happens in this particular case is the vitamin B12 is used by this mutase enzyme to help abstract an H atom from this methyl group. So we essentially take away this H atom, we take away the one electron with that H atom, and we basically help form a sigma bond, a single bond between the H and the carbon as shown in this particular diagram. And we also generate a radical species on this carbon. And so we form this unstable reactive intermediate. Now, in the next step, we basically want to take this entire group shown in blue and move it onto this carbon. So what happens is, this carbon, along with one electron that is present in this sigma bond, goes away and moves onto this carbon to form a sigma bond between this carbon and this carbon. At the same time, one of the electrons in this bond that is broken remains on this carbon number two. And so that is what we see in this diagram. So this carbon number two is this carbon shown in this diagram that contains this single electron. Now in the final step, we basically want to regenerate this vitamin B12 group. And so what happens is one of these H ions along with one of the electrons moves on to form a, po uh, a sigma bond between this carbon and this H atom. And we form this succinyl coenzyme A and we regenerate that coenzyme, the vitamin B12 that is used by the methyl malonyl coenzyme A mutase. So ultimately in step three, we transform the methyl malonyl coenzyme A into succinyl coenzyme A. And once we generate that succinyl coenzyme A, this can now go into the citric acid cycle to help generate ATP molecules. So 
we see that any time we have a fatty acid that contains an odd number of carbon atoms, it will undergo the beta oxidation process to ultimately generate acetyl coenzyme A molecules and this propanyl coenzyme A molecule. These acetyl coenzyme A molecules are fed into the citric acid cycle directly, but this propanyl coenzyme A has to undergo this three step process to help generate the succinyl coenzyme. Enzyme A that now can be fed into the citric acid cycle. Now, the last thing that I'd like to discuss is vitamin B12 deficiency. What happens if an individual is vitamin B12 deficient, for example, because of malnutrition? What exactly will happen? Well, in an, in an individual that is vitamin B12 deficient, uh, deficient, this reaction will not actually take place and will have a buildup of this intermediate molecule. So because we have no vitamin B12 in vitamin B12 deficiency, this mutase will not be able to transform the L-methyl malonyl coenzyme A into the succinyl coenzyme A, and that will essentially build up this L-methyl malonyl coenzyme A. And that particular individual will begin to excrete this molecule in the urine. And so a physician can basically test the patient's urine and look for the buildup, look for the presence of this molecule. And if that's the case, then that might be because of vitamin B12 deficiency. Now, in another case, we can have a mutation, a deficiency in the mutase. So in an individual who is born with some type of genetic mutation in which this mutase is not active, the same thing will happen. If the mutase cannot uh, activate this, re uh, catalyze this reaction, then we will not be able to transform the L-methyl malonyl coenzyme A into the succinyl coenzyme A. And so we're going to see a buildup of this intermediate inside that individual and that will be excreted via urine.